1854, the city of Chicago experienced an epidemic that would kill 6% of its entire population. The problem was polluted drinking water. The city of Chicago sits at sea level, which means that sewage would flow down the Chicago River out into Lake Michigan, where, which is where the city would get its primary source of drinking water from. In response to the crisis, an engineer by the name of Ellis Cheesebro posed not one, not two, but three ideas that were not only incredibly ingenious, but seemingly impossible. His first idea raised the entire city of Chicago. <laughs> In 1860, a block of buildings on Lake Street was elevated four foot eight inches by a team of 600 men and 6,000 jack screws, and a new foundation was laid beneath that block of buildings. In 1866, the Briggs Hotel took up an entire city block. It weighed 750 tons. They put it on jacks, and they raised it a quarter inch at a time, and did so, you got to love this, with guests staying inside the hotel. Cheesebro would go on to install 152 miles of sewer pipes beneath Chicago during the decade that it took to raise the entire city of Chicago. But Cheesebro was not done dreaming. His second idea was to build a water intake tunnel to get clean drinking water from Lake Michigan. It was the longest, it was the deepest, it was the biggest tunnel in the entire world at the time. Two teams started digging 60 feet below street level. One team started on shore, and the other team started two miles out into Lake Michigan near the water intake station, and somehow they met in the middle. They dug by hand 16 hours a day, and then the graveyard shift would come in at night, and they would lay brick to fortify the tunnel that the day shift had dug that day. Now, both of these were endeavors were epic feats of engineering, but Cheesebro saved his most daring and outrageous idea for last. The city of Chicago had grown from a population of 30,000 in 1850 to over 500,000 by 1880. And all of those people were dumping their garbage and their sewage into the Chicago River, along with, by the way, a plethora of slaughterhouses that were dumping animal remains in the Chicago River as well. And Cheesebro had already raised the city. He had already built the largest and longest tunnel in the world, but he proposed his last idea, and when he did, it shocked even the most avid believer when Cheeseboro said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to reverse the Chicago River. What? <laughs> reverse the river? If they could pull it off, the pollution would no longer flow out into Lake Michigan. It would actually flow out and would act like a sewage pipeline taking it away from the city and its people. It would take 20 years, tons and tons of dynamite, dozens and dozens of dams, but Ellis Cheesebro would eventually defy the very laws of nature. And on January 17, 1900, they put on their long black coats, they put on their big black top hats, and the Sanitary Board of Chicago posed for a picture and then opened the floodgates, and the rest is history. Welcome to Canvas Church. <laughs> And the first Sunday of 2022. And the reason I told you all of that is because my prayer today as we start a new year together is that we would believe together like cheese bro. <laughs> that the impossible is still possible and through the spirit of God we would live our lives in a way that we believe and know that it is. That even though there may be some things in your life and in my life that are flowing in the wrong direction, that through God's power, through God's grace, through His Spirit, through the, the, the obedience to His Word, that we would understand we can reverse the river and experience greater things in 2022 than we ever have before in our lives. That's what I pray for you. That's what I pray for all of us this year. Because let me say something that I think we need to settle right now in every one of our hearts and minds. Listen carefully. It's going to sting just a little bit, but here it comes. Our lives are perfectly designed for the results that we are currently getting. I didn't expect you to shout me down. Our lives are perfectly designed for the results that we're currently getting. Here's what I mean. 
You know this, if we keep doing what we've always done, we're going to keep getting what we've always gotten. And the great news about this day and every other day for that matter is that you and I are only one important decision away from an entirely different life. It's the truth. In fact, before I drop into the meat of the word today and where we're going, I want to share with you three things as I thought about today and the, the beginning of this new season and new year. I think there's three things that you got to settle and put in your heart and mind that will help you, I think, season your heart correctly for change to occur in 2022. Let me give you three suggestions, three tips, three screenshots. Number one, you have to start by renewing your hope for the future. Let go right now of the thinking that's in the back of your mind that is saying to you, I've tried change for years, I've tried it over and over and over and over, and I cannot change. That is a lie, and the enemy uses it every day to keep people down as long as he can. You have to believe again and trust again. Find some, we like to say, junkyard dog around this place again. you got to find some courage. you got to find some grit you got to find some tenacity and believe that God can help you change. When you read scriptures like Jeremiah 29 and 11, I have often told you that that was not a great scripture in the middle of a good place in Israel's history. They were in a terrible place, but God gives them a great verse, even in a terrible moment, because that is the MO of God. God never speaks to our present condition. When God speaks to us, he always speaks to our potential. God doesn't call us out. He calls us up to what he knows we can be by his spirit and by his word if we are prepared to change. You can be different. You need to believe that. You need to believe that your marriage can be different. You got to believe that. You got to believe that your children are going to come home, that your home can be different. You got to believe that it can be different, which leads me to number two. You've got to get past your past. Forgive yourself. You know what I found out about myself? I found out that it's a whole lot easier sometimes for me to believe that God can forgive me than it is for me to forgive myself. Sometimes it's not that our memories are so bad. Everybody always talks about that. Sometimes it's that our memories are too good. It's that we remember the little things that we said. We remember the things that we did. We remember the things that we should have done that we didn't do. And it looms over us like the ghost of guilt. You've got to make a decision to let go of the hurt. Let go of the shame and the pain of 2021 and the bitterness and just start fresh right now. People often talk about repentance and sometimes it gets a bad rap in the church world, but repentance has never been a negative thing. Repentance is a beautiful thing that was introduced to us by our Heavenly Father. It's a theological term that essentially means to make a course correction. <laughs> it means a course correction means that I'm going to make up my mind right now that I'm never going back to that thing. I'm never going back to that way of life. I'm going to repent of it. I'm going to turn the corner. It's over. It's in my past. And I'm moving forward with God from this day forward. I love Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. And I love who wrote it. Because the Apostle Paul had a lot of things that were looming in his past. And here's what he said. Brothers and sisters, I, just, I know that I have a long way to go. In other words, he said, I've not arrived but I'll tell you this one thing that I've had to learn how to do in order to be effective for God and to live a different life. I forget what's in the past, and I try as hard as I can to reach for the goals that are still before me. He had some skeletons in his closet, and if he didn't learn how to over them, he would have never done anything great for God. You've got to renew your hope for the future. You've got to get past your past, but listen to this third one, because I think it's the most important one. You have got to make a greater commitment to, to work biblical instructions into the rhythm of your life. Make a commitment today in a greater way to work biblical instructions into the rhythm of your life. You know what I've learned in my life? Every destructive issue that has ever crept into my life comes when I have strayed away from the instructions of my Heavenly Father. But we have the power to change that. We cannot keep doing the same things that got us into terrible ruts and think that somehow time is going to magically change it. It will not. In fact, let me just say to you that the truth is when you're doing the right things, time is your friend and it's working for you. But when we're doing the wrong things, time is our enemy and it's working against us. When we are moving in the wrong direction, time compounds and multiplies the problem and they grow larger and more destructive over time. I love the old West Texas proverb that says, when you discover that your horse is dead, dismount. Right? 
Just get off that sucker, man. <laughs> Quit trying to give it more spurs. You're not going to wake it up. It's not going anywhere. Once you realize that what you were doing isn't working, stop doing it. And try something new. And try something different. Work biblical instruction back into your life and stop trying to figure it out yourself and see what your heavenly father has to say. I will promise you things will begin to shift for the good. I'm preaching. So, I love this scripture. I I love it in every translation. I, I, I love it so much, but I love it in the message because of the way that it says what it says. We're going to turn the corner right now. And I want us to drop down into where we're going for the rest of our time together. I love Romans chapter 12, and I love it in verse 2, but I love, again, the message translation. Here's what it says. Fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. Learn to recognize what God desires for you, and then quickly respond to it. If there's ever been a true statement, listen to this. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Every time we say yes to God, every time we put God first, every time we obey his word, every time we work his instruction into the rhythm of our lives, what God is doing is bringing out the best in us, what he has created us to be. And it's beautiful. And what I think is so important about that is today I want to share with you One of the most powerful and profound principles found in all of the Bible, and that is the principle of first fruits. The principle of first fruits. Simply put, it means that I'm going to focus all of my attention and energy on what I do first. In fact, there is a principle, if there is a principle that runs from cover to cover, if there is one, and there's more, but if there's one that goes from Genesis to Revelation, it is the principle of priority or the principle of first things. Over 130 scriptures, Old and New Testament, deal with the principle of first things. The principle of first things essentially says that whatever we prioritize and put first in our lives will ultimately direct, shape, and mold the rest of our lives. What you do first, what we prioritize first, will ultimately begin to shape, direct, and mold the rest of our lives. So with that principle in mind, how do we, on the first Sunday of 2022, apply this to our life? How do we live this out pragmatically and practically so that this principle can help our 2022 be more than we ever maybe thought it could be? Let me give you three things today. I hope you get ready to take some screenshots or some notes. The first one is not going to sound profound, but it is. You've got to make God himself first in your life. Make God himself first in your life. Did you know that statistically, the majority of the people who live in this country acknowledge a belief in God? They acknowledge that they believe God is real, but simply acknowledging that there is a God provides no power for anything. In fact, I'll take it a step further. If God is in your life, but not first in your life, you will never experience everything that he promised you you could or would. If God is in your life, but he is not first in your life, you will never experience all that he promised that you could or would. Let me say it another way if you're taking screenshots. What activates God's promises in our lives is when he actually becomes the priority of our lives. It's what makes it engage. Healthy life-giving relationships are never one-sided. You know that. They are built on two individuals that have clearly gone all in with each other. In fact, if you have ever been in a relationship where you clearly were more interested and more in love with the other person than they were with you, you know exactly what that feels like, and it's not good. So you're dating someone, right? And you go, you know what? It's my birthday tonight, and uh, I thought we may just go out to dinner to celebrate my birthday. And if they look at you, if some dude looks at you, lady, and and he says, you know what, I'd love to, but it's Taco Tuesday with the bros, and I'm going to have to just bail out on that one. I'm going to just give you a, a little suggestion, okay? Probably wouldn't go look at rings just yet, all right? Just, there's something not quite right about that relationship. A relationship that is one person 
who is clearly more committed than the other, is a truly dysfunctional relationship. And what it does, and you know this, it kills the drive and the soul of the one who desires to be all in in that relationship. And before you say, oh, pastor, that's just human relationship. That's not how God feels. Really? Do you read your Bible? (laughs) I'll give you one. There's multiple, but I'll show you a place that kind of shows you how God feels about it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 5. Then God gave the people all of these instructions. I'm the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, place of your slavery. You must not have any other gods, only me. Do not make for yourself an idol of any kind of image or from the heavens or from the earth or from the sea. Do not bow down or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous for you. God is je- Anything that we start to love, fear, or serve more than God, God gets bent out of shape a little bit about it because he covets our love. He wants that, he wants that relationship as it should be. God is jealous for us because he's crazy about us. And he simply asks for us to reciprocate that love and make him our priority as well. And by the way, that is not unreasonable, ladies and gentlemen. God has every right to ask us to make him first because he went first and he put us first when he sent his only son to die for us even when we never loved him or cared about him in the moment. God always models what he expects. So in this first point, I'm saying this. Start 2022 by starting right now and settling right now that if God is in your life but not first in your life, you are going to make a course correction. You are going to repent from that and you're going to say, Lord, anything that has crept into my life that I love, fear, or serve more than you, I repent of it, I turn the corner, and God, I am reinstating you as truly the Lord over my life. And when you do, you invite and usher in the Holy Spirit in your life in a brand new way. Number two, number two, honor God by giving him the first of everything. Honor God by giving him the first of everything. There is a principle in the scripture that in my opinion, I don't think is always taught correctly. And I love to teach it. I've taught it for years. And I think even early in my life, I probably didn't fully understand it like I do now. And I don't think it's taught in the fullness of his context, and that is the principle of tithe. And when I say tithe, most of the time, everybody's mind goes to one place. They, they go to tithing as exclusively a financial principle, and it is not that way in the Scripture. It is so much bigger. It is so much broader than that. God did not institute tithing simply as a way of getting Israel to give finances so that they could create a city, erect walls, and build temples. Now, I thank God that that happens. This is one of the most generous churches that I have ever pastored in my life, and I am so proud of you, and thank God that I am on this journey with you, and Tina and I are the first ones to give every single week and always will be, not because we are the pastors, but because we are passionate about what God is doing in and through this church. And I thank God that we're able to build buildings. I thank God we're able to buy property. I thank God we have staff. I thank God for all of that. That's fantastic, but that was not the real intended purpose of God instituting tithe in his people's lives. Let me show you where the Bible tells us exactly what it's about. Deuteronomy 14, 23. Bring this tithe before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose at his sanctuary. This applies to your grain, new wine, olive oil, the firstborn of your flocks and herds. Watch it. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first. In your lives. That was the whole deal. That was the whole deal. That's the real reason. Tithing has so much a bigger application than just finances. And applying it to every area of our lives teaches us to make sure God is first. And I want to give you four ways that I pray we would do this as a church this year. Four ways that we're going to do this as a church this year. You ready? Here we go. Number one, I'm going to ask you to give God the first of our year. Join me in giving God the first of our year. Today at sundown, I am calling us as a church family to 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
And if you have never fasted or you don't understand what a fasting is or fasting is, I want you to go to the website and there you're going to find the four different types of fast that we highlight out of the scripture. And I want you to take the rest of the afternoon and I want you to pray about what God is leading you to do and about what it is that you want to select and choose. And then today at sundown, as a church fellowship, as a canvas group of people, as a collective body of believers, we're going to pray and fast for 21 days. Each week we will usher out and post a prayer that I want us as a church family to pray all week long. And we're going to do this not to bring attention to ourselves, not to try to get people to see how holy and religious we are, but we're going to do it to show God and to prove to God, Lord, once again, we are reinstating you as the first and most prominent thing in all of our church's lives. It's all for your glory, Lord. It's all for your honor. And we're going to give you the first of this year because we're asking your blessing to be over the rest of our year. And so today at sundown, join me, will you? Join me for 21 days. Find what God is calling you to give up for 21 days. And let's pray and fast together. And let's just watch what God will do in and through our lives. Number two, give God the first of our month. Give God the first of our month. How do we do that? We do that through scheduling and through budgeting. Take the first of your month and look at your calendar and see where you are going to intentionally make time for God. Because here's what I'll promise you. If you wait to see what's left over, there never will be any. My life is busier than it's ever been. You're busier than you've ever been. We are more hectic than ever before. And what I have learned is that life will never leave us margin accidentally. Margin will be created only intentionally. So you have to schedule God into your life. If you wait for time to spend with God, you never will. Same thing with our budgets and finances. I've always said I'm so thankful that 29 years ago, even when Tina and I were broke, I'm talking about broke, I made $240 a week. That's what we made when we were married and had two kids. And, and when we came back to the Lord, I, I said to myself, if I'm going to have the audacity to believe John 3.16, if I'm going to be able to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that counted for me, if I have the boldness, the audacity to believe John 3, 16 is real, I have to believe that Luke 6 and 38 is as well. That if we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. If I'm going to believe John 3, 16 and 17, I've got to believe Malachi chapter 4. That when we bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that God will open up windows over our lives, that there'll not be room enough to receive, that he will rebuke the devourer for our sake. And I said, I'm not going to just cherry pick the Bible and believe the ones that I like and then ignore the ones that kind of rub me the wrong way. If I'm going to believe John 3, 16, I'm going to believe that the same God wrote Malachi chapter 4. And we begin to tithe and honor the Lord 29 years later. And I'm going to stand up here flat-footed and tell you without stutter, stammer, or equivocation that 29 years later, my testimony is you will never outgive God. You will never be able to outgive God. I double dog dare you to try. I'm going to create a slight breach of etiquette like Christmas story. I triple dog dare you. <laughs> Put God first in your finances and in your budget and in your calendar and watch what you unleash over your life. Number three, God, give God, listen to this one now, give God the first of our week. I pray this year we would give God the first of our week like never before. What am I talking about? I'm talking about honoring God by worshiping and resting. I'm talking about the principle of Sabbath. The principle of Sabbath was this. Sabbath was actually on Saturday, not Sunday, but the early church moved it from Saturday to Sunday for two primary reasons. The resurrection of Jesus happened on a Sunday. And number two, they wanted to worship and honor God on the first day of the week, not the last day of the week. So they moved it up so that they would tie their week to the Lord. Make gathering together with your church family this year a next level priority in your family's life. Worshiping together and being in an environment where the Holy Spirit is moving and God's word is being shared and encouragement and love is flowing among the brothers and sisters it does something in our lives that nothing else does. Hold on now, because I love you and I'm your pastor. But go ahead and just buckle on up because I'm going to tell you something that I've observed that I have watched it happen over and over and over Parents who love their children that are hoping that they will grow up to love Jesus. I want to say this to you and I want you to hear me as your pastor in love. Don't ever expect your children to make God a priority when they have watched you make him an option your entire life. 
They won't. Because our children hear what we say, but they believe what we do. And I remember, I remember standing with a gentleman that I love very much to this day. He's got two grown kids that don't care a thing about God, a thing about church. Now they'll tell you they do, but they don't honor God in any way in their life. And I remember him weeping to me that they were so lost. And I said in love, I said, I got to be honest with you. What you told your kids, because they were a traveling ball family, I said, what you told your kids was, God is really, really important except for baseball season. Except for in baseball season. And what we told those kids and what he taught those kids was that when we traveling and we rolling and we hitting the ball, we'll work God in wherever we can. And then when they became adults and married for themselves, now all of a sudden God is not a big deal in their life because their parents treated God as this option. I love you. I don't want to, listen, I'm tired of picking up the pieces of broken lives. I'm tired of watching parents weep and struggle and cry and pray and, 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 and ask God to redeem their kids. Here's what we believe in this church, that if we can reach kids while they're small, we won't have to try to rescue them when they're men and women. Make them a priority. Make God a priority. Make God's house. If, if, if COVID taught me anything as a pastor, it was the, the power of not, uh, uh, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. I thank God that for those 18 weeks we were shut down, our staff rallied and we produced amazing services and we tried to stay connected as best we could. But I, every week that passed, I was more convinced that when the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the people of God gathered together in one location, something happens there that will not happen in any other venue anywhere. I'm not going to say that. I was going to say, no, I can't. That does somebody will play it later and I'll get in trouble. We're going to meet and we're going to worship and we're going to pray and we're going to sing and we're going to preach. And we're going to trust God to just do what God wants to do in and through our lives. But we got to give God the first of our year. I'm asking you to join me in doing that. Give God the first of our month. I'm asking you to join me in giving God the first of our week. Make church a priority like never before in your life. And watch what God will do in your family. Number four and finally, let's give God the first of our day. Hold on to your seats, but I want you to write this down. I ain't got a slide, but listen carefully. I wrote this down and it even hit me. You need to check your soul before you check your phone. Because you know what I found out happens to me? This world is toxic. Y'all know that. It's full of sin and toxicity. And when you pick that thing up and the first register your brain has is that negative garbage, it seasons the rest of your brain and your mind. And it makes you cynical and jaded and somehow affects the rest of your day. I, I used to love Zig Ziglar. Some of y'all are young. You don't maybe know about Zig Ziglar. But I, I read everything Zig ever did. Zig was a motivational speaker, a great salesman. But he, was, he loved the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Zig used to say something that I agree with completely. This was back before technology and social media and all of that. But Zig would always tell people, he said, I get up every day and I read the Bible and then I read the newspaper because I like to see what both sides are up to. <laughs> I agree with that. But read your Bible or spend time with God before you see what the other side's up to. It'll make your day go so much better. And it'll season your soul with worship and not with cynicism. It'll season your soul with the goodness of God, the grace of God. It'll affect the way you see the rest of your life and day. Give God the first of your day. And I ain't talking about, you know, an hour where you shave your head and you you know, chanting like a Tibetan monk, okay? I'm not talking about that. You know I don't advocate that. I always talk about tweet a prayer to God, right? Just tweet 140 characters or less. God, I'm here. I love you. I want my life today to bring glory and honor to you. Would you lead me, guide me? Would you speak to me today, Lord? It's all it takes. Watch what I... You're inviting God into your life from the very moment that you take a breath. And I promise you, when you invite Him in, He will show which is my third point. Expect God. This is so bad. You got to expect that God is going to show up and do what he promised he would. After you have honored the Lord, after you've been obedient to his word, after you've done the things that he's asked us to do and prioritized him in our life, 
You can fully expect that God is going to show up and do what He promised He would. Believe that God is going to honor His pledge and His word. Live with an expectation that God is going to move in your life in a greater way. God is going to move in your family in a greater way. God is going to move in your mind and heart in a greater way. The promises from cover to cover in the scriptures when it comes to this principle of first. In fact, I want to show it to you as we wrap it up. I'm telling you, here's what it says in the Bible. This is the principle of first fruits. When we honor God with our first and best, He has promised to multiply and bless the rest. When we honor God with our first and best, He has promised to multiply and bless the rest. And I could not preach a series of sermons and possibly testify and tell you of all that God has done in our life, in my wife and my life, in our family's life. It's been staggering. Oh, everything don't always turn out the way that I draw it up. No, 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 no. Everything hasn't always shook out the way that I hoped it would. There's twists, there's turns. But in all of it, God has been faithful. All things have in Indeed, work together for the good to us that love God and that have been called according to His purpose. We have seen God move in so many unbelievable and unprecedented ways. You can trust that God is not just a promise maker. He's a promise keeper. I'm going to read this last verse of Scripture. We always love to quote this one. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I don't know why we stop at 5 and 6 so much. Because 7, 8, 9, and 10 are just as good. I'm going to read it in the message translation. It says, trust. I want you to notice, notice, notice this repetitive word. Trust God with all. Everybody say all. All your heart. And don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in all you do. And He will keep you on track. Run to God. Run from evil. Honor God with all everything you have give him the first and the best and your barns will burst and your wine vats will run over and overflow you will never be able to outgive God and when you prioritize your life to honor God first again you usher in and invite the Spirit of God into your family into your business into your life in ways that you can't possibly imagine so on this first Sunday of 2022, let's honor God with the first of our year. As a church, let's honor God with the first of our month. Let's honor God with the first of our week. Let's together make a decision. We're going to honor God with the first of our day. And let's just see what God does in and through not only our church and our region, but in our families and in our homes.